Hey, good day everyone. Today I'm going to give a talk that I've given a few times now called Risk Prediction and Introduction. I made this talk as sort of a primer to try to get biologists up to speed with some of the basic concepts in machine learning. The outline of this talk is as follows. I'm going to try to answer the question, what is prediction and what is risk? Both of which, of course, are needed if we were to talk about risk prediction. I'm going to talk about how do we build a model to predict risk. I'm going to talk a bit about how we verify a model. And then I'll go on to mention a couple a couple common pitfalls in prediction that I often see uh, biologists new to the field make. I'll talk a little bit about deep learning because there's a lot of excitement around that. And then I'll end by mentioning some of the ongoing challenges in this field. So let's start with what is prediction. If we pull out a definition from the dictionary, we see that prediction is a statement that says what you think will happen or the act of making such a statement. We can also come up with a more statistical definition of prediction. And this is an excerpt from a wonderful paper by Bremen. And he writes, statistics starts with data. Think of the data as being generated by a black box in which a vector of input variables X go in on one side and on the other side comes out the response variables Y. Inside the black box, nature functions to associate the predictor variables with the response variables. There are two goals in analyzing the data. One of them is prediction, which is to be able to predict what the responses are going to be for future input variables. So what can we predict? Well, all sorts of things. We can predict disease as in the presence or absence of disease. We can predict disease in terms of severity. We could predict the optimal treatment for a disease. We could predict demographic factors and so on. The things we predict are often called the dependent variable, which is a common language in statistics, or you might just call it an outcome or an output, or just give it the variable name y. What is it that we can predict from? Well, all sorts of things also. We could predict from biomarkers, demographics, the pixels of an image, text, and so on. The things we use to predict we usually called something like independent variable, which you see more commonly used in statistics, a predictor, a feature, or just variable X. I'll generally use the term feature here because that's most comfortable for me. So what is risk? Risk is the possibility of something bad happening in the future, a situation that could be dangerous or have a bad result. If we put this together, then risk prediction is a statement about the possibility something bad will happen. In risk prediction, we have an outcome, which is a bad future event, say disease occurring or not occurring, or the severity of a disease. And the features are anything that we want to use to make that prediction. But I'll be talking mostly about biomarkers as an example, because that's what I'm most familiar with. So how can we actually build a model to predict risk? Well. We'll begin by representing the input features or the predictors as a matrix X, where you have some number of samples, we'll say N samples, and some number of predictors, say D predictors. And then we'll represent the outcome for those same samples as another matrix Y. In this example, there's only one Y, say the disease happens or doesn't happen, or the disease is bad or not bad. And now this data is paired. So for each sample, we have both the features and the outcome. We then want to try to find a function or create a function, f, that estimates y from x. So you'll see in the equation below, this function takes x as an input, and it produces something that's like y. We call that y hat, which is an estimation of y. We then can measure the goodness of this estimate. Y hat is a function of X, and we can compare that Y hat to the true known value of Y by taking the difference between the two, Y hat minus Y, for each sample, squaring it so that the negatives become positive, and then adding up those differences. This, in the machine learning lingo, is called an error. Uh, 
you're familiar with statistics, you might recognize this more as a residual. It's, uh, it's also often called the loss. Now, how do we actually get that back? Well, in the old days, this F was handcrafted. It was, they call this expert driven. It was hard coded using if and then statements. You might say, if this one predictor is bigger than this number, and if this second predictor is bigger than the second number, then y equals one, otherwise y equals zero. This was popular in the 1960s and 1980s, but it fails for complex tasks because we simply don't know all of the rules that are necessary to make a prediction. The more conventional contemporary approach is to do data-driven apps where the function f is learned automatically from the data. This is called supervised machine learning, and it's the most popular paradigm, and it's what I'll be focusing on for the rest of this talk. So just to get a better understanding of some of this uh, jargon, I think this image is quite helpful to say is that there's this broad idea of artificial intelligence, which is to create computers that make decisions. This includes these hard-coded if-then statements and the expert-driven approaches. A subset of artificial intelligence is machine learning, which is trying to get machines to learn automatically from the data. A subset of this is deep learning, which we'll talk about at the end of the talk. So the machine learning basics is like this. We've got some data, which we call the training data, where we know both X and Y. We know the predictors and we know the outcome. The outcome has been measured. The risk has been measured. And we're going to use this data to learn F through some complex algorithm. There are many choices here. We've also got another data set, which we call the test data, where X and Y are also known. And we're going to use this to see if F is any good. We're going to use this by deploying F, getting the prediction, which we call Y hat, and comparing that y hat against y. Now, we use this test data to see if our function f is any good. And if it is, we might then take it out into the real world where y is not known, but x can easily, easily be measured. And then we can use the function f to guess y. And if the outcome is something that occurs in the future, then this is a model that we can use to try to predict a future event. Now, how do we actually learn F? Well, we do this every time we fit a linear model. And if you can think about the fitting of a line as a type of machine learning algorithm, it can make it a lot easier to understand the more complicated models that are more frequently used. So the linear model is a linear function that minimizes the error. If we have some input X for say a single predictor, and we have some output y, we're saying that there is a function that has the form mx plus b, some slope times the input plus an offset that approximates y, which we can call y hat. And we can draw that function y equals f of x as a line. And the error is simply the deviations off of that line raised to a power and added together. These are the residuals, these are the error. So here's one way of learning an arguably simple function, f, that can predict y from x. And a lot of machine learning deals with finding new ways to learn complicated functions that perform this basic type of task, but functions that have some specific properties. One example is a support vector machine, where let's say you have two input features, two predictors, which are the X uh, and the Y here. And you've got two classes, you've got the circles and the stars. You want to try to find some line that separates these two. And that's the support vector machine. The function is the hyperplane discriminating your classes. You could try to learn a decision tree where you have a number of clauses that compares your predictors, C1, C2, and C3, against some uh, threshold value. And depending on whether it's true or false, you can classify samples as A or B. 
You have random forest as another example, which takes your data set and cuts it up into a bunch of smaller mini data sets to learn unique decision trees, which together vote like a democracy cast ballots for their favorite class. And then that class is the one that the, the random forest model ultimately chooses. Another method is K nearest neighbor, which is to say for a new point, we try to figure out which of the groups that already exist is that point closest to. And we can say, all right, if this point here, this star here, when we consider the three closest neighbors, we see that black outweighs red. And so we would call that star the black class. 